Good afternoon, QPAM. If you could take out your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Nehemiah as we continue our sermon series in the book of Nehemiah. Today's reading will come from Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1 to verse 16. And at the end of the reading, please respond with a faithful thanks be to God for his word. Again, that's Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1 to verse 16. Now when Sambalit and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors and the gates, Sambalit and Geshem sent to me saying, come and let us meet together at Hekaferim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sambalat for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear of these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say have been done for you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking, their hands will drop from the work, and it will not be done. But now, O God, strengthen my hands. Now when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, who was confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, should, should such a man as I run away? And what man should such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin, and so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sambalat, O oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid." So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month Elul in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and felt greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this, this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. Pastor Peter will come to give the sermon. Thanks, Josh. I would ask how you're doing, Josh, but I already know he is still in the midst of finals and papers. I think he's only slept... What, three, four hours, Josh, the past two days? So you're hurting a bit. I'm sure some of you guys are hurting as well. How are you doing this Lord's Day? <clears throat> How are you doing? Aaron, I pick on you all the time. You choose to sit in the front, so I pick on you. How are you doing, Aaron? <clears throat> well, I'm good. What's going on these days? Work, yes, work. That's a common answer. <clears throat> I ask this question a lot, obviously, meeting people, saying hello. How you doing? I'm good. What are you up to, huh? Work. Busy. I'm just busy. What are we busy with? Work. Work. Life. Family. Relationships. We're busy with life. And maybe that's just how we see life to be. How are you doing? I'm busy. <clears throat> with what? Work. How do you view work then? How do you view your work in your life? Today is a particularly busy day at church. There's a lot of work being done here after service. Of course, it is the first Sunday, right, of the month. So we have birthday lunch downstairs. Then 2 o'clock, we have our first retreat planning committee meeting. Wow. Since 2019, we haven't had a QPAM family retreat, a congregational retreat. Praise be to God that we're going to go back again this August. But there is a lot of work that entails, right, planning a huge retreat for our whole entire QPAM family. Dean Rumi's gonna come up at the announcements to share more. She's our retreat coordinator. She's got a lot of work and please help her out. She's gonna be recruiting volunteers for that work. We have a young adult, 35 and up, fellowship today after church as well. Again, we do this once a month just to really get a couple of young and old members to share life together, to build relationships between our members across generations at QPAM. It's a lot of work to build relationships even amongst our generations, let alone cross generations. And we're striving to work to build those relationships at QPEM. And at four o'clock, we have our Kenya mission team meeting, first meeting that we're gonna get together. So much work we know. 
to plan a mission trip to go overseas and share the gospel to the people in Africa. There's a lot of work and preparation entail for that. After that meeting, we have our joint missions prayer meeting today. A lot of work to coordinate missions at our church. KPCQ, we're sending mission teams to Kenya, to Honduras, to Cambodia. And then we have kingdom missions reaching Pakistan, China, those nations that we cannot even send teams to because of Christian persecution. There's a lot of work to coordinate the mission work that God has planned for us this summer. And then, still not done, at 6.30, there's this multi-ethnic department meeting. I shared a bit about this at our congregational meetings. It's now this new formally formed committee department at church because we are a very unique church, four congregations, one family, right? English-speaking QPAM, and then we got the Korean-speaking, Chinese-speaking, the Russian-language-speaking congregations. But we're not just four separate churches. We're one church. And so it takes a lot of work to, to be one church that really works together, partners together, that really shares life together. We have our upcoming Memorial Day picnic that we've been sharing later this month. Um, it's the one day where we get together for fellowship, but the purpose and goal of this year's Memorial Day picnic is going to be very intentionally different. Before, uh, years ago, I don't know how many years this began, it started as just more of an Olympics day, a competition sports games day where we just play games against each other, but it morphed into a little bit more of a just kind of a picnic, right? Before COVID, it was more of a picnic with the four congregations, yes, meeting in one site, but we were all separate, weren't we? We had our own, you know, picnic sites, and we all ate separately our own food, and then maybe, you know, for games, we brought our own teams to compete against each other's, uh, you know, congregations. And then uh, for the raffle, right, we all got together to try to win for our congregation. And then we just left, right? Um, that was fun in terms of QPEM, but um, this Memorial Day picnic is going to be different. We want to really be intentional just one day a year, think about it, to focus on fellowship intercongregationally, to fellowship with a brother or sister in the Russian congregation, the fellowship with a brother or sister in the Chinese-speaking congregation or the Korean congregation, right? I mean, how often or when do we ever get to do that? And that's our opportunity we have this Memorial Day picnic. Come for that Monday. Mark it in your calendar. Join us for that. And our multi-ethnic department is planning intentional activities and events to bridge our relationships together, at least for that one day. Pray for us because it's going to be hopefully not a long, long meeting tonight. It might go very long. I got a Rangers playoff game to watch later on too. So there's a lot of stuff going on. It's going to be a long day of work, planning, stuff to do. We have a lot of work going on. You have a lot of work going on in your jobs, in your schools. And our work keeps us busy. But at times, the work that we are doing, it distracts us from a bigger work a greater work that God has called all of us to. And it's his kingdom work, isn't it? That's what we've been learning. That's why we've been going through Ezra and Nehemiah. We've been seeing God's great work carried through in this book of Nehemiah. Specifically here, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. The city's walls have been destroyed, right? Again, these walls are not meant to function as some kind of defensive barrier against Persian emperor. Of course not. How can these walls you know, defend a city against Persia? No, but it's symbolic. These walls served as what? An identity. Reminding the people of who they are, who their God is. They're the city of God. These walls would provide a sense of dignity to the Jews, restore that sense of purpose and, and meaning, the eternal kingdom perspective of who they are, and God's eternal plan of redemption. And so it is a vitally important work that is being done in Jerusalem to rebuild these walls. And we've learned already thus far, great opposition comes when God is doing his work, right? And today I'd like to reflect on work, on our work that we're doing in our lives, but more in particularly in light of a great work, a greater work that God calls all of us to. A great work that we see in our passage today. I'm going to look at three ways work in our passage. Three lenses that we see work. First one, we are going to see once again the enemy's work. The enemy doesn't stop. The enemy continues to work. Opposition. 
threats to God's kingdom work. We're going to look at the enemy's work. Then we're going to see our response in our work, the work that we do with our hands. But ultimately, we're going to finish off being reminded of God's work through His Son, Jesus Christ, God's work. So again, simply put, the enemy's work, your and my work, and then God's work. You know, we've been seeing the enemy at work, right, through Nehemiah. Attacks, it started, remember, before? From the outside, from all four, uh, uh, you know, quadrants. They're, they're surrounding the city, the ring of enemies. It came from outside the threats, external threats. Then it went internal. Remember last week? Internally, threats, attacks from within the community. That injustice we talked about. The, the, the wealthy, the more have not, uh, exploiting those who do not have. The poor within the same family of God. Internal attacks. Now there is an attack that Satan launches. It's a personal attack, in particular in our passage, directed to an individual, in particular the leader, Nehemiah himself. And we see three of Nehemiah's enemies who appeared earlier in the book. They've returned once again, Sambalit, Tobiah, and Geshem. These guys, again, <laughs> man, they just don't go away, do they? They just do not quit. I mean, come on, just leave, just, just fly away. But you're annoying. They, they just won't leave. That's, you, that's Satan, okay? The enemy just will not leave. It's a stark reminder. Satan's always at work. It's not God's working. You know, these three, they, they've lost earlier, but here they come again. They lost round one. They're back for round two. They're adamant to win. <clears throat> and so let's take a look in our passage, verse one again. And we start out with the enemy's work. It says, now when Symbolid and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, they came and, and they had a plan here. You know, again, Sambalit, Tobiah, Geshem. This opposition from all sides against the God of Israel. All three, they're trying to ensure that Israel, that Jerusalem does not rise in political power. The best way to prevent this is through this political alliance, okay? It's common enough that, you know, people that have nothing in common together, they'll ally what? themselves together against someone who poses a threat to their individual ambitions, right? They all have individual ambitions, but together now, collectively, they work together because there's someone that poses a threat. These ambitious men, they're carrying out a plan. They see the completion of the wall almost finished and with each stone being placed, built on this wall, this threat um, to their... Uh, ambition and their political aspirations becomes more real. Again, Nehemiah says, although up to that time I had not set the doors and the gate, there, there's no breach left in it. It's almost done. Everything is almost finished except just the gate doors perhaps. And so these enemies, they go right at Nehemiah. They can't have time to, you know, call for military opposition or anything else. Let's go right at the leader. This is it. It's almost done. So look with me in verse 2. Symbolic, Geshem sent to me saying, Come and let us meet together. Let's meet together at this summit. Akifirim in the plain of Ono. In these plains, let's come together. This political summit for talks. <clears throat> Neutral ground, they say. In one of the villages in the plain of Ono. Perhaps some 70, 27 miles northwest of Jerusalem. It's not in our territory, not in your territory. Let's meet this summit, a peace treaty per se. Common, perhaps, maybe it's like a trade agreement, right, between neighboring communities, right? Let's benefit all those who come to this summit. We're all neighbors now, aren't we, Nehemiah? We need each other for commerce, for trade. So let's get together to discuss some mutually beneficial arrangement that we can have. They entice Nehemiah. Sounds good so far. Nehemiah, we see you as a man of power, of importance. You're a governor. You can do things. You can speak for your people. So let's come to the table. That sounds so appealing. You know, the enemy uses flattery a lot to get us to do his work or to listen to him. Flattery usually works to get someone to do something that you want them to do. You know what I'm saying? You ever do that? You ever use flattery? You ever flatter someone to try to get Someone to do something for you? Yeah, somebody, yes, shaking your heads. I do that a lot, unfortunately. Well, I'm not proud of it, but, you know, there's some times that are needed. Like one time my flight was canceled. 
What are we going to do? Our flights are canceled. We got to get on the next flight. There's a lineup of people. They're just trying to get on that quickest next flight available out, you know. You can see the representative. She's dealing with all these people that are upset and annoyed. She's getting tired of, you got to go work it then, right? Go to the rep. I can see you're so tired. I'm so sorry that you have to deal with all these rude customers. Oh my goodness, they have no patience. I'm sure you can't wait to go home. By the way, you're doing a great job. I want you to know you're doing just an amazing job. Just keep it up just a little bit more. Uh, you're, you're doing great. You're doing great. By any chance, um, would it be possible actually to put us on the next flight? By any chance. By the way, that, I, I read somewhere that that's like an incredible phrase to use to try to get something from people that you're, you're, you're trying to seek or whatever. By any chance, is it any possible? Any possibility? Oh, you're doing great. Flattery works a lot. And, you know, more often than not, they respond. They're doing flattery to Nima. Nima, oh, look at you, governor. Come. You got power. You can do things. Come on. Let's meet together. Sense of pride. Saying a tax writer, a sense of pride. Look what, who you are. Look what you've done. This is you. Let's meet together. Let's go. Come on. The wall is almost done. And once it's done, Israel, now the identity is there. The city of God is, is rebuilt. The enemy is not going to let that happen. It's going to come at all costs. Any way to stop God's people from building that wall, from doing God's work. To keep us distracted. How are you doing? I'm busy. What are you up to? I'll oh, just work. <sighs> Anything to stop us from building the wall. Has the enemy done so lately with you? Any particular ways? The enemy has perhaps convinced you, whether through flattery or otherwise means, to take a pause, halt from building the work. Take a break. There's other things going on that are important. You know, there's a fictitious story that a member sent me and captures this point. I think quite well of what the enemy is doing. This one story goes that Satan... He called this worldwide convention of demons together. In his opening address, he said, you know, we can't keep Christians from going to church. Look at all, the, all of you here. At least you're coming to church. We can't keep them from reading their Bibles. Some of us faithful to God's word and knowing the truth. We can't keep them from forming intimate relationships with their Savior, Jesus. You know, once they gain that connection with Jesus, our power over them is broken. So let's, Let's think of a plan. Let them go to their churches. Let them have their, you know, covered dish dinners. But you know what? Let's steal their time. Let's steal their time so that they don't have the time to develop a relationship with Jesus. So Satan says, this is what I want you to do. Distract them from gaining hold of their Savior, maintaining that vital connection with Christ throughout their day. The demon shouted, how shall we do this? Keep them busy. Keep them busy in the non-essential things of life. Just busy work. Invent innumerable schemes to occupy their minds. Tempt them to spend and spend and spend and spend and spend more money and borrow and borrow and borrow more. Persuade the families, all of them, husband and wives, to work long hours, six, seven days a week, 10, 12 hours a day. Why? So that they can afford their empty lifestyles, of course. Keep them from spending time with their children. And as the families fragment and fall apart, soon their homes will offer no escape from the pressures of work. Continually, mind you, overstimulate their minds. So they'll never hear that small, still voice in their ears. Entice them continually. Be on their phones. Nonstop, wake up, turn on your phone. Social media, scroll, scroll, feed, feed, feed after feed. Whenever you're awake, it's always by your side. Constantly bombarded. Media, news, wisdom, worldly wisdom, insights from the world. Surely not wisdom, wisdom from Scripture. It's going to jam them. This is going to break that union with Christ. You know, fill, pound their minds with news nonstop of just devastating news, destructive news, 
flood their mailboxes. Junk mail, sweepstakes, every kind of newsletter, promotional offerings, keep skinny, beautiful models on the magazines and, 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 and on their movie screens and TVs. Their husbands will believe that outward beauty is the most important thing. They'll become dissatisfied with their wives. Keep the wives too tired then to love their husbands. Give them headaches because if they don't give their husbands the love they need, they'll begin to look elsewhere too. This is going to fragment the families. Give them Santa Claus to distract them from teaching their children the real meaning of Christmas. Give them an Easter bunny so that they won't talk about the resurrection and the power over sin and death. Have them return from their recreation. Lots of recreation, lots of vacation. And have them return being even more exhausted than they were when they left. Keep them too busy to go out in nature and reflecting on God's creation. Send them to sporting events, plays, concerts, musicals, amusement parks, movies. Keep them busy, busy, busy. And when they meet for spiritual fellowship, uh, involve them in gossip, small talk. Crowd them, their lives with many good causes. They don't have time to seek power from Christ. Soon they'll be working in their own strength sacrificing their health and family for the good cause. It'll work. It is going to work. This is quite the plan indeed. Demons went eagerly to their assignments, causing Christians everywhere to be busy and busier and more rushed and more tired from work. Little time to love Jesus or their families. Little time to Tell others about the power that Christ is doing to change our lives. How has the enemy been distracting us, calling us away from the great work? How has the enemy been calling us away from this building project? Stop. Come down. Nehemiah, come down. They're calling Nehemiah to the summit. Stop the work. There's other things going on. <sighs> Nehemiah displays great wisdom in verse 2. He sees right through the enemy's plans. He says at the end of verse 2, he knows, but they intended to do me harm. There's no change in them. What evidence does he see from these three that, 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 that has given a change of heart to their invitation? What good is going to gain if he attends the summit? Is there any common ground here? There's nothing to gain. Wisdom, Nehemiah sees this. It's a trap, right? It's a trap. Either to kill him, literally to physically murder and kill him, or to compromise him in the eyes of his people. Maybe the I envisioned something like this, a little telegram being sent after if he does go visit this summit. We are very sorry, people of Israel, to have informed you of this. But on his way to Ono, Governor Nehemiah met with an unfortunate incident. His chariot collided with a rock and somersaulted several hundred feet over a ravine into the valley below. Despite every effort to save him, we have to report to you that he is dead. Please accept our sincerest apologies. No, Nehemiah is not going to fall for a trap. He sees right through it. Satan's schemes is evident. Because he's holy, he's a man of God. He sees how the enemy works. We have to understand how the enemy works. We have to understand how the, he goes about scheming ways to distract us and get us to stop from doing God's work. We have to be aware of this. Nehemiah is. He responds. Look at his response in verse 3. And I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should work stop while I leave it and come down to you? Incredible. How amazing is that response? I am doing a great work. I can't stop. How can you ask me to stop? I'm doing something. I'm, I'm so focused, you know. You ever be, do something, you, you, some project or some work, whatever, that, that you're just so, you know, in, in, engulfed in and people try to, you know, tell you to stop. You just, I was at the young adult retreat, right? What was it, January? And, one of the exercises you guys were doing, activities, you know that, what was that, that puzzle or whatever? 
I'm going to 500 piece puzzle or something. It was like impossible puzzle. Man, you guys were diligent working at each group's table. And there's one group just like literally just all like just in a zone, just focus and building this puzzle together, thousand pieces or whatever. And we're saying, hey guys, it's time now to get back together. It's time to get worship started. I'm telling you, they didn't hear a single thing, you know. They're so focused. They're like, guys, guys, we got to actually go to worship. Literally, I'm just got to finish, got to finish, got to finish. You've been part of something so important, so so you know, inspirational. I gotta do it. I gotta. You, you ever consider God's work that? We ever consider being part of God's work, doing God's kingdom work, something so important, so so vital, that without any distractions, the people are trying to tell, hey, hey, kids, take a break. Come on, we gotta do this, do that. We gotta go with something else. No, I can't. I, I'm just so focused. Do you ever see God's work doing that? What a response from Nehemiah. All these distractions, all these temptations, flattery. I'm doing a great work. I can't come down. No, I'm not going to stop. Oh, what a response. What a holy response. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, what our lives would look like? How would our lives be different if we responded with such a statement every time the enemy comes at us with distractions and taunts every temptation Satan throws at us every dart he, he flings every word every 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 everything that 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 he's saying to to get us to stop from doing God's work whatever that may be can you imagine what our lives will look like if we responded with that I cannot stop because I am doing a great work our lives I, I would dare say it would be quite different our lives would be quite Changed, I would say. The enemy's not quitting. Even after such a response, the enemy never does. This continued opposition, verses 4 to 7, they sent to me four times in this way. Four times, they just don't quit. Satan never will until the final judgment day. And I answered them in the same manner, Nehemiah says, he gave him the same response. Enemy keeps at it. Nehemiah keeps responding. I'm doing a great work. I'm doing a great work. I'm not stopping. You can't stop me. There's nothing you can say to distract me. I'm doing a great work. Don't give in. Don't compromise. Don't let the enemy have a foothold in your life. Because he will not stop. And we ought to respond with that same answer, with the same conviction. I'm doing a great work. It's far better than what you are enticing me to do. Don't compromise. Don't compromise. You know, in today's day, there's a lot of temptations, a lot of different, you know, even, even issues that, that, that are, are, are calling even Christians to the table, to a summit. Let's come to the summit. Let's come to the summit to talk. Let's discuss these things. Okay, these, this discussion is good. You know, we ought to strive for unity. We ought to strive for peace. But what's happening is a lot of these Issues that, that come up and, and, and calling, you know, professed believers of Christianity to come to this table. Issues such as same-sex marriage, such as abortion, such as transgender. All these issues are coming up and say, come to the table. Let's talk. Let's compromise. There's a difference between being loving to one another and loving each other and compromising our faith. There's a difference there. There's a difference between seeking unity and, and wholeness and, and peace in this world at the expense of God and his word. There's a difference there. If anyone is calling you to compromise your faith in what you believe to be God's word, his truth, his design for humanity, and it's conflicting, it's going against what God has designed, that's not unity. That's not love. Nehemiah is a standard bearer for the conviction that he believes in who God is. That some things are worth standing up for. And that's what Nehemiah displays, his conviction. Martin Luther, we know him, the 
great reformer Luther in 1521 at the Diet of Worms. This is what he said. That unless I am convinced by the testimonies of the scriptures or by clear reason, I cannot and I will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. That's conviction. God is looking for believers that have conviction in faith. And I believe God, his word is true and it is good. It's righteous and, and it is the design for us to follow. For our good, I believe it. The enemy is attacking, is attacking, attacking. Symbolic continues this enticement in verse 5 to 7. The same way Symbolic for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter. And again, this letter is reported among the nations in Geshem. That you, the Jews, are intending to rebel. You're build, re, building this wall. You're desiring to become king. Let's take counsel, Nehemiah. And obviously now, obviously this is no more longer cordial. This is not longer a peace summit. <laughs> This letter is saying that, hey, you, the Jews, are plotting rebellion against Persia. You're trying to take over the crown. I'm going to make sure that King Artaxerxes hears of this. So let's come, take counsel. Let's talk about this before you get in more trouble. Nehemiah's response. And then I said to him, no such thing as you have said have been done. For you are inventing them out of your mind. You're inventing, making things up out of your own mind. Another response. When the enemy is, is saying all these things to us. To confuse and, and, and persuade and dissuade you from God and his word and, and his plans and his work in your, in your life. Oh, you know, come do this. You know, no, it's, it's okay. It, you know, it's, it's love, not, not war. You know, come on, let's come together. Let's kumbaya. Like, it's okay, right? No. This is made up. These are lies. Satan, the enemy, is the father of lies. We cannot listen to the enemy's lies. Satan is trying to bring us down. He's trying to discourage us. He's trying to make us doubt, regret, frustrate us. And what that frustration leads to, it leads to anger. And, and, and then what? We lash out against people, against even our loved ones, our families, our spouses, our children. At work, we're frustrated. We fight with our coworkers. We, we talk bad about our bosses. This is what Satan wants. Lies. Don't believe it. No such thing as you say have been done. You're inventing this out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us. Nehemiah says in verse 9. Their hands will drop from the work, they think. And it will not be done, the enemy desires. Satan wants to frighten us. He wants to scare us. He wants to stop you from doing God's work. He wants to stop you from living according to his word. He wants to stop you from, from upholding your convictions and your faith. Nehemiah pleads, but now, oh God, strengthen my hands. God, it's hard. It's not easy. No one said it was or is. We live in a world that is attacking Christian faith. It is. At the very core of what we believe, that there is only one way to salvation. There's only one person who offers meaning, hope, life, significance. And God has designed a, a way for us to experience joy and satisfaction. The world says, no, well, there is, it's not the only way. Who are you to tell me this is the only way? How dare you? Who are you to judge others? Who are you being so entirely? You're hypocritical, you Christians. Come on, it's okay. Come, come, come join us. Come, come. You can miss church one day. You can, you can, you don't have to be so reformed. You don't have to be so convicted in the Bible. It's just a bunch of stories, isn't it? Come on. It's okay to compromise a bit. They want to frighten us, scare us. The enemy does. God, strengthen my hands. God, help me, because yeah, if left just to me and my flesh, I will fall. I'll fail. I'll give in. Yeah, I'm honest about that. God, I need your help. 
Oh God, strengthen my hands. It's a prayer we need each and every day before we go out into this world. God, strengthen my hands. More, more attacks comes. More trouble if it wasn't enough from symbolic Geshe. Now there's this more trouble. The governor visits this prophet Shemaiah to hear of this assassination plot. In verse 10, he went to this house of Shemaiah, confined to his home, and he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple. For they're coming to kill you, Nehemiah. They're coming to kill you by night. So let's go, let's go. Come with me. Immediately, let's go to the temple. Close the doors. Provide sanctuary. Satan's trying to trap us. Satan's trying to entice us. It's very obvious here. It's very subtle in our days. Do this or don't do this. If you don't do this, you're going to... So you're not going to have security for your future. You're not going to have enough saved up for your, your, your retirement, you know. You got to cut a little corner here at work. That's how people advance in your job, okay. Oh, you can cheat on your test, on your final exam, on your paper. You can, you can play your Why? Everyone else is doing it. If you don't, you're not going to get that A. You got to keep up with the other students. You got to peak. Come on, keep you on top. You're not going to get the job that you want. Nehemiah, come to the sanctuary, to the temple. First off, it's, it's illegal for Nehemiah. He's, he's not a priest to enter the temple. No, nothing in Scripture that Nehemiah obviously knows of that provides a safe sanctuary in, in Jerusalem, right, to hide in a temple. Nehemiah understands this is not it. No, this is not wise. So what to do? God gives wisdom. In verse 11 to 13, but I said, says, shut some man as I run away. Well, man such as I could go into the temple and live, I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced a prophecy against me because Tobiah and Symbolet had hired him. And for this purpose, he was hired that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin so that they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Near my nose. I'm not running away. Running away is a sign of defeat. Enemy is working now also to, to, to get us to sin, right? To get us to sin. To sin, what is the sin? It's to disobey God. A sin is what separates us from God. When we sin, guess what happens? When the Christian church sins, we get a bad name. And then we get taunted by the, this world that, that is mocking, again, Christians. Look at Christians. Oh, you guys are the biggest hypocrites. Prominent Christian leaders have fallen from grace. And you know how much devastation it's done to the, the, the Christian church? Pastor Bill Hybels, Pastor Mark Driscoll, even Ravi Zacharias, we've heard. These men that we look up to and admire and respect and, and follow the teachings. It's a mockery now. These people of God who profess his faith in Scripture, yet their lives have completely contradicted what they profess and preach and teach. If it can happen to them, can happen to us. There's not one of us that is more above any person of will and might to withstand Satan's temptations and, and, and schemes on our own. There's not a single person by their flesh that can do that. God gives us wisdom. He's given Nehemiah wisdom to clearly see what's going on. And he gives him power. Oh, God, strength in my hands. He gives him power to resist temptations and the taunts of the enemy. And ultimately, Nehemiah goes to prayer once again in verse 14. And he prays here, remember Tobiah and Sambalit, oh, my God, according to these things that they did. And also the prophet, prophetess, Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. Remember them. Again, this is, it's not a prayer for, for vengeance per se. It's what... Nehemiah is praying, this prayer is a prayer for justice. We talked about that last week. God's justice against those enemies that are trying to thwart his plans to stop his work and his people. God, remember them. And God does. God is a God of justice. God's justice will prevail. And then through prayer, and through power, through resisting temptation, through God's wisdom, Nehemiah comes, and we see in verse 15, after all this time now, 
So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month. 52 days, actually. That's not long, but it is finished. Approximately 445 B.C. The commentary is disabused, but around 445 B.C. The wall is done. It has been complete. In our final verse, in verse 16, and when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid, and they fell greatly in their own esteem, for they per perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Praise God. Throughout this whole story, throughout this whole narrative, this whole journey, opposition, Satan, he has been working every trick to stop God's work. This project that Nehemiah was watching over was trouble from the beginning to the end. It was not easy by any means. Look again. Israel's enemies that tried to make God's people afraid. In the end, it's they themselves who are the ones who become afraid. Verse 16 again. All the nations around us were afraid. The fear that Satan tries to instill upon God's people, no, it's flipped right back. The enemies now are afraid. When God works, the enemies shake, church. When God works, the enemy trembles. Satan trembles at the foot of Christ. When God does a mighty work, the unbelieving world, it trembles. Why? Because the great work has been accomplished, that's why. Because this great work, it's not still ongoing and still undecided of, of who's going to win in the end, good versus evil, God versus Satan, Jesus. and Satan. No, it's not just left up in the air. Against all threats and all opposition, God's son, Jesus Christ, he defeated Satan on the cross. And he finished the work, that great work to accomplish salvation for God's people. The great work, the greatest of work. It's so great because you and I can never have accomplished on our own. It's a work that God had to do for us. It is as great as it can be. R.C. Sproul, he says, God the Father, he designed this work of redemption with the view to provide salvation for the elect, that Christ died for his sheep and laid down his life for those the Father had given to him. The redemptive work, the redemption of specific sinners was an eternal plan of God. And it was accomplished, finished by the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Praise be to God. It is finished. It has been accomplished. It is done. Christ is victorious. Does that give us hope? I hope it does. How can it not? We don't just believe in a God uh, who, who just sends Jesus to die on a cross and then let's just cross our fingers. I hope that, you know, it was enough. Or I hope that, you know, I can take advantage of Jesus' atoning death. You know, this world, someone, you know, oh, I hope that maybe, you know, I'll come to faith in him one day. No. What Christ did on the cross, he died once and for all for the redemption of those sinners as part of God's plan. The will of God to save his people. It is finished. It's accomplished by the atoning work of Christ. There's nothing else left to be done. It's not left hanging now for someone else to finish. No, it is done. Jesus finished the work. You and I, those who profess faith in Christ alone as our Savior, our Lord, we are saved. Isn't that amazing? That's the gospel. The good news. The atoning work of Christ is sufficient for all. It's sufficient what Christ did to cover the sins of all people. And those who put trust in Christ will receive the full measures of the benefits of that atonement. It's offered to all who believe. It's offered to you even today. Perhaps some of you who have never received Christ as your Lord and Savior. Perhaps you've never been given this invitation to receive Jesus as your, your Savior who died for your sins today. God once again invites you to receive his gift of mercy. Take part. Join in God's redemptive plan. All you have to do is believe. 
and confess that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I cannot save myself. Oh, no matter how many good works I've done, no matter how many good deeds I've done, no matter how good of a person I am, it cannot save me. I realize that today. Thank you, Jesus, for doing the work that I could never do. Praise be to God. Come, receive faith, and then take part in what God's doing. Because the last thing, when, when, when all our enemies heard of it in verse 16, all the nations around were afraid, and, and they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. The enemies know now that the people of God accomplished their task, not just on their own, not just by themselves with hard labor and the shovel and the sword in their hand. No, they accomplished it with the help of our God. Human hands, yes, built the wall, but concurrently, God built the wall. God did it. We are part of what God is doing. And we work out our salvation, as Philippians says, with fear and trembling, because God is at work in us to do will and to do his work for his good pleasure, church. Because of Christ's work, you and I can now work with meaning, with purpose, with a greater perspective, through a different lens, perhaps. Maybe now even seeing your own work or students, seeing your studies, our jobs, you know, what are we busy? How are we doing? I'm working. Well, can we now see it in light of the great work that Christ has done on the cross for you? Now, I want to invite the worship team up and have some reflection questions for you today. How do you view your work? We're all in different lines of work, different careers and vocations, students studying different things and whatnot. How do you view your work now? And let me pose this question to you. In light of the great work that Christ has done for you on the cross. Can you see that? How do you view your work in light of the great work that God is doing in this world? Not just in your office or in your business or whatnot, or on your campuses. How can you view your work in light of the great work that God is doing in this entire world, in the greater picture? Can you see that? Perhaps what are some ways as you are involved in God's work, that the enemy has been distracting you and calling you away from God's great work, even flattering you uh, or telling you lies. You need to do this, focus on that to be successful and be happy. How has the enemy, has he succeeded in keeping you busy? God is giving us encouragement to you. That you're not just there to fend for yourselves. No. God is with you. He is for you. And he has given his son, his life to you, to die for you. And Jesus is with you on that battlefield. He's giving you power to resist temptation in your life. He's giving you power each and every day. The power that resurrected Christ from the grave. It's the same power that's offered to you to combat Satan and the enemy's work. Taunts from the enemy each and every day. You have that power. Pray for that power. Oh God, strengthen my hands as Nehemiah prayed. Would you pray that prayer? Pray that prayer right now. Oh God, would you strengthen my hands? Because I am weak and I will fail. I need you, God. And lastly, could you just picture a finished wall? What does a finished wall look like in your life? Because in Nehemiah, they finished the walls. And it brought them purpose and identity. What does the finished wall, the completed work, look like in your life today? I pray that it has a picture of what God is doing in your life, through your life, for His greater kingdom. Let's pray to Him, church. Reflect on His work.